All right, guys, welcome back. Yes, you have made it. 51 lessons. We've studied the book of Genesis, and now we're finishing up the book of Exodus. Moses is a busy guy. He's been writing a lot, and we are finishing out his thoughts from Exodus 40. Now, think about this. Yes, just yesterday, we covered Exodus 39, where, you know, the guys were, were told to make these holy, holy garments. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. You know, they're told to make an ephod, a breast piece, a, a robe, a tunic, a turban, a sash, a medallion. And then, oh, by the way, uh, I want you to go make sure, Moses, you inspect everything and get everything lined up. And now it's time. It's time to finally put all of this together so that God's presence can dwell in the tabernacle. Can you imagine just like, well, looks good. Let's do it. I mean, Rich, you've built how many houses have you built, Rich? Uh, three. Three. Is this, can you, can you relate at all about getting all your materials and your inventory, everything at, at, at the beginning? Yeah, it's a lot. You just got to keep track. Uh, since we did it ourselves, so we were actually our own general contractors and laborers. So uh, it was a lot to... Like it never stopped. You would build during the day and then at night when you thought you would rest, nope, you would have to be keeping track of your materials list and ordering more and going making a whole bunch of decisions. And yeah, it just did not stop for many, many months. And so he's, he's here. That, that, that point of it almost stopping is here. And you know, how, what a great feeling. I've never had this. My dad has built uh, numerous homes as well, but I've never had the feeling of building your own home and then sitting in it. You know, like what an awesome feeling. And then more importantly, to let your family sit in it, to let your friends come into the place that, that you have, have built based on the instructions from the Lord. That's what Moses is beginning to feel. Now, here we are almost one year later after the Israelites left Egypt, almost one year later. And it says in verse two, well, first of all, the Lord spoke to Moses. And then he says, you are to set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Remember my dwelling place on the first day of the month. I want to dwell with my people, and now is the time that my presence is with you. In verse 3, it says, put the ark of the tes testimony there, and screen off the ark with the veil. Verse 4, then bring in the table, and lay out its arrangement. Also bring in the lampstand, and set up its lamps. In other words, what you're going to hear in, in Exodus 40 is that, okay, now everything's here, and it's, it's almost like one more step. Like, he's still not building it. You know that, right, guys? Right now, he's just being told, now I want you to bring this. So I'm going to tell you how to build it. You're going to tell everybody how to build it. They're going to build it. And now you've gathered all of these belongings. You're on your Ace Hardware lumberyard truck. You're bringing it literally uh, to the place. And I want you to bring these things. And so like, we're there, but not quite. So he says, then bring in the table, lay out its arrangement. Also bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. The one thing I'll, I'll tell you about Moses, this guy has an impeccable memory. <laughs> Uh, you don't ever hear him say, what'd you say again? You know, like he's, he's got this down. He's got it. And in verse four, right, he's, he's, he's bringing these things. Verse five, it says, then he bring, placed the gold altar for incense in front of the Ark of the Testimony, put up the screen for the entrance to the tabernacle. I mean, he's telling him, going over here to our map, and we're gonna get into, into detail today about this, but he's telling you, I want you to put everything into place. Don't do it yet, but I want you to, to put it in place. In verse six, position the altar of the burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle in the tent of the meeting. Now, to me, I think this is really, <laughs> like, I'm so anal type A. I'm thinking, position the altar of the burnt offering. Should it be a little more over here? No, Aaron says, but a little more over there. You know, like, you know, like, how does he know? Like, the exact spot, I'm telling you, he's so in tune with the Lord. He knows how this thing fits. It's a pretty powerful picture, you guys. It says in verse 7, place the basin between the tent of the meeting and the altar, and, and put water in it. And my first thought is, is does it have to be special water? <laughs> I mean, right? You know, like everything else is special. But and my, my point is, is like, God has it so down. And just to, you know, to fill a brazen lava out, you know, to, to fill the basin right here, like, it's not like they have a hose. Hey, turn it on! You know, like there's no spigot to turn on. They're hauling water. And do you have any idea where they're at? Anybody want to know? They're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. It's not like water is just gushing out of trees or rocks, right? And so my point is, is like when they're doing this, like there's a whole lot of detail that Moses continues to walk by faith as he's told to build this. Verse 8, assemble the surrounding courtyard and hang the screen for the gate of the courtyard. Moses probably wasn't little. You guys, you know, <laughs> he probably had to use a couple rocks. My point is, is like, 
Make this real. This is hard to do. This isn't like we have all of our DeWalt's and all of our power tools and all of our electrical cords. Like they're building something from scratch based on what the Lord told them to do. And he's doing it by faith. And then he says, all right, you've got everything together. You're assembling it all together. And now here's what I want you to do. In verse 9, I love this. He says, I want you to anoint everything. But the point of this anointing, you guys, is that you're saying God is blessing this. God's presence is here. And so he's telling Moses, Moses, I want you to make sure everything is covered. Take the anointing oil and anoint the, the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it along with all of its furnishings so that it will be holy. And so it's a special olive oil, just so you know, from Exodus 30, 22 through 23. It's okay, Kevin, you don't need to go there. But you have this special olive oil, okay, that I want you to make sure everything is going to be holy. So all of these planning, these preparations, I want you to make sure you're finishing well. In verse 11, anoint the basin in it, stand and consecrate it. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You guys remember we talked about the holy garments and we talked about how Aaron and the sons, they were getting ready for, to serve uh, as a Levitical priesthood to say, I'm in for the rest of my life. And oh, by the way, before you do, I want you to make sure you bring them over to the, to the basin and make sure you wash them with water. I want to make sure they understand they are being cleansed by my presence. In verse 13, and when they're done taking a bath, make sure you put some clothes on them. <laughs> Clothe Aaron with the holy garments anoint him. So don't just forget the, te the, the tent pegs are great and so are the bases and the posts, but now I want you to anoint my servant, Aaron. It's cool. He's, he's saying, hey, Moses, make sure your brother gets anointed. Isn't that a cool picture? Your, your older brother. Anoint your older brother. Consecrate him so that he can serve me as a priest. How cool is this? Moses is functioning as a prophet. His brother's coming in, functioning as a priest. It's a, it's a whole family affair. Clothe him, anoint him, and consecrate him. What an honor it would be for this, for this man, Moses, to do this. And then it says in verse 14, uh, by the way, don't just finish anointing the, the, the buildings, the properties, uh, Aaron. Make sure it says um, that you get uh, his sons as well. And have his sons come forward and clothe them in tunics. Anoint them just as you anointed their father, so that they may also serve me as priests. Their anointing, watch this, will serve to inaugurate, watch, a permanent priesthood for them throughout their generations. And so what's going to happen is, is that this Levitical priesthood is going to carry on, it says, as a permanent priesthood. And it's going to start with a father and some sons. You know, this anointing, I can't, I can't move on without addressing this whole issue here. Uh, when you believe in Jesus Christ, okay, let's slow down here for a second. You are given the Holy Spirit. No questions asked. Instantly, there's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you're in agreement, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> That's the most active we've been today, guys. Uh, and so because of that Holy Spirit inside of you, you automatically receive the anointing. You don't have to be some special guy that's traveling all over the place and speaking or some guy that's always running a camera and you have a special anointing. No, because of the Holy Spirit, you are anointed. And so in 1 John 2, Verse 20. I want you to go there, Kevin, if you would. 1 John 2, verse 20. Uh, yes, the priesthood is being anointed to do the work, but the scripture says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you have knowledge. And then if you go to verse 27, so we have the anointing. And then in verse 27 it says, the anointing you receive from Him, watch this, remains in you. Not trying to be funny at all in this. The Spirit of God doesn't leak out and you lose Him and He doesn't come back. You have received the anointing and he's inside of you and you don't need anybody to teach you. So go ahead, just turn it off. We're done. School's over. <laughs> I mean, praise God. And so, and so here's the deal. You have the anointing, but we don't even realize it. Instead, watch this. His anointing teaches you about all of the things and it's true. It's not a lie. Just as he has taught you, remain in him. I'm telling you, if the body of Christ is the school, if this folks right now that are listening, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm telling you, if you begin to, to press in with the Holy Spirit and realize you've been anointed, you'll walk in confidence. You'll walk in authority. You'll walk in humility. You'll walk in grace and in truth. You'll actually walk like you have uh, faith in the Messiah. You're going to do things that actually start not making sense. You want me to anoint who? 
You know, I remember Mindy who, uh, who painted this incredible painting. I remember she's told a story. She was at a restaurant and she walked up to some older folks in Canada because the Lord had given her a prophetic word just to speak into their life. When you walk into the anointing, you're going to start doing those things. We, we can't function like we don't have the anointing. And I think that's the problem. We don't believe we've been anointed. We don't believe we have the Acts 1-8, that, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the power. And I'm telling you, this anointing sets us apart. This anointing is what makes us different. It is part of our holy garments that we are carrying. It's, it's the anointing. And so what you're seeing is, is back in the Old Testament, you have Moses anointing Aaron, anointing the priests, anointing everything because this has been set apart. Well, guess what? We are the walking anointing now. We are the ones that are set apart from the world. That's the beautiful thing of the anointing. And I'll just tell you this, it's okay to pray for the anointing uh, in, in places. It's okay to pray for people to be anointed. And you'll say, well, they already have it. You know what? You got to pray for them so they realize that they have it. Anyway, so here's the point. Go back to verse 15, Kevin, if you would. Uh, what, what do you guys think about that? Do you guys think people realize that we have the anointing? I don't think so. I mean, it, it's a process. It is a process. You know what I love about David, King David? Uh, before he became king, but remember when he was anointed? He walked out that anointing. He was specifically called. And remember, and he, he was running into the battlefield because he believes he's been anointed. When you realize that you've been anointed by the Spirit of God, then you don't have to convince people. They'll just begin to do out of obedience what they've asked them to do. You guys have anything else you want to add to that? Rich, you good? I mean, I just think for me personally, sometimes I just get so caught up in life that I just forget that, you know, what, what really should possess me inside. And so um, I just forget that that power is in there. Yeah, and I think, to be honest, I think we go back to the ways of, in Scripture, in Ephesians, it talks about the world, the flesh, and Satan. And so we, we try to fight that in our own strength rather than depending upon the Holy Spirit in Galatians rather than walking in the Spirit and walking in that anointing. And so that's why we're always losing. You know, the, the moments that I'm tired, okay, which feels like a little bit more lately, <laughs> is when I'm walking in my flesh. That, that's the reality. When I'm walking in my flesh, yeah, it helps if you get more than two or three hours of sleep. That would be nice. You get my point. When you walk in the flesh, uh, you forget to walk in the anointing. You forget to walk in the Spirit of God. And so what Moses is doing in Exodus uh, is he said, you guys, I am anointing you through, through God, through His power. I'm anointing you to do the work that I've asked you to do. And then in verse 16 of Exodus 40, pretty powerful picture. Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. I wonder if, if they took a survey of your life, okay, you're listening right now, if the Lord would say, you did everything I asked you to do this year. I wonder. I wonder how you would respond if you know the Lord's told you to do X, Y, and Z, and you're like, no, I like X and I like Z, but there's no way I'm doing Y. You know, I think we come up with these lists of, I don't want to do this, but I'll do this. But what Moses did, he did everything as the Lord commanded him. And in fact, seven times what you're going to see, seven times, seven times, you're going to hear the language just as the Lord had commanded him. And so in verse 17, here we go. Finally, this is like the Super Bowl moment of Exodus. I mean, besides the Red Sea, that was a pretty big deal. Besides the Passover, that's a pretty big deal. Now you have the tabernacle being built. Moses is responding to God saying, okay, put it all into place. You've anointed everything. You got everything covered. You got your brother covered with some oil. His beard is still dripping with oil. Thanks, Moses. You probably put a little too much on. And so what you have is that everything is coming together. The tabernacle will set up in the first month of the second year on the first day of the month. You're like, I need Google Calendar for that one. And so here's what you have. In verse 18, Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases, positioned its planks, inserted its crossbars, and set up its posts. Verse 19, then he spread the tent over the tabernacle. Think about this, you guys. And so he, he's beginning this process. He spreads out, look, at the tent over the tabernacle. And he put the covering of the, on the, of the tent on the top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Scripture continues on in verse 20. Moses took the testimony. All right, Taylor, you ready for this one? We're in Exodus 40. This will be really good. Mm. Do you have any idea what the testimony is? He no. took the testimony. <laughs> Kevin, will you help him? It's the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Stone tablets. Don't edit that out, by the way. <laughs> so Moses took the testimony. He took the Ten Commandments. He placed it in 
the ark. And so can you imagine he's putting the cover over this? He's taking the testimony. He's putting it inside the ark, right? He attaches the poles. I, I would just be like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe I was at Mount Sinai twice. <laughs> 40 days and 40 days. And I smashed it one time because of my brother and all those things. Now I've anointed him. And now he's serving as a priest, a high priest. And now I'm taking the Ten Commandments. And for all of these millions of the people that are supposed to follow this, like he's implementing what he heard. Have you ever walked out and answered a prayer? Have you ever walked out something you've been praying for and you're like, man, this is, this is working. You know, in so many ways, when you walk by faith, you should experience that every single day of your life. And it says, Moses, he set the mercy seat on top of the ark. So he put the mercy seat on top, the testimony, that the Ten Commandments are inside. He attaches the, the poles. And then in verse 21, 21 the, the scripture continues. He brought the ark into the tabernacle. He put up the veil for the screen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is going to sound really bad. You know, like when you do a campsite, you know, and like you're just getting everything ready and, you know, you're hauling things out of your van and the way you get it in your van is you just shove it in, right? You know, like you kind of wonder what some of the stuff where it was before he brought it here. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden it becomes holy. But you get my point. Like that's, that's how real <laughs> this is. He brought the ark into the tabernacle. He put up the veil for the screen. And remember, the screen up off the ark of the testimony, just as the Lord had commanded him. Everything God told him to do at the Mount Sinai, it's happening. In verse 22, Moses, he placed the table. And so now here we have, he placed the table right over here. The table of the showbread. Uh, man, what a cool picture. On the north side of the tabernacle, outside the veil. In verse 23, he arranged the bread on it before the Lord. So here he put the table and, and now all of a sudden, hey, who made the bread? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, this is awesome. He arranged the bread. So now he's got bread makers and now he's putting it here. Like everything is coming together. And remember, all of the Israelites were recognized, not just one, not Bezalel, not Aholiab, not just Moses, but all of the Israelites were recognized for doing the work of the Lord. I believe God put everything together and Moses just began to, to put it into place. In verse 24, now he, he put the lampstand. It says in, in, uh, uh, in verse 24, number five right here is the, the menorah that you guys know that you'll see over the Christmas time uh, for the Jews. They obviously don't celebrate Christmas so that you'll see the blue, the lights, and you'll see the menorah. That's, this is where it comes from, you guys. He put the lampstand in the tent of the meeting opposite the table of the south side of the tabernacle. So <laughs> I know this sounds obvious, but he was instructed to put it on the south side, opposite side of the table. So everything was so detailed. Wouldn't that be awesome if God just came in and designed your house? Yeah, I think you should put your bunk beds there, Kyle. And I think your trampoline needs to be here. Like, it'd be really nice if God just, if he just did all of that for us. I just compared a trampoline, I know, to the table of showbread. I think you get my point here. My point is God knows exactly where he wants everything to be. Kevin? It's his house. Ah. That's why he's the smart one at the table. <laughs> Kevin, that was genius. Kevin, you remember when I asked you how many, uh, <laughs> how many commandments there were? How many laws are there, Kevin? Not 735. <laughs> <laughs> 612, 735. Can I get 800? No, that's awesome. Exodus, we've had a lot of good memories with this crew here. So uh, in verse uh, 25, he set up the lamps before the Lord just as the Lord had commanded him. He continues to do this in verse 26. Moses also installed the gold altar in the tent of the meeting in front of the veil. Again, more and more. And the burned fragrant incense on it. We're going to talk about this when you get into Leviticus, the burned fragrant incense. Okay, There's not a whole lot of things about the animals and the blood, but there's certain times that you'll put blood there. It's really a cool picture. And then in verse 28, he put up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle. Now, because of time, I'm not going to do this, but I literally have everything written out so that when it says he put up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle, you can go back to Exodus 26, verses 36 and 37, and then you can actually see uh, how they did all this, how they built this, and when they were told, and what does it look like. And so it, it's just crazy how everything lines up. From when Moses heard about it, he tells Be Bezalel, they do it, and now put it in place, and now they're, now they're doing it. In verse 29, then he placed the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tabernacle. This is the busiest place that you're going to see in all of the courtyard, okay? This right here is going to be the most busy place that you're going to see the tent of the meeting and offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on it, just as the Lord had commanded him. Now, we can fly through that right now in Exodus 40, but I promise you when you get to the book of Leviticus, 
you're going to be like camping out on the burnt offering. You're going to be camping out on the grain offering. And so he did these things just as the Lord had commanded him. And then in verse 30 and following, it says, He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. There's the water. He, he finally is putting, hey, oh yeah, like there it is. I'm pretty sure he had incredible help. Hey guys, I need, some, I need some water right here. Let's gather this. And it's an incredible team effort. And so in verse 31, Moses, Aaron, and his sons, how cool, washed their hands and feet from it. And they washed whenever they came to the tent of meeting and approached the altar just as the Lord had commanded Moses. In verse 33, next Moses set up the surrounding courtyard for the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate of the courtyard. And here's the line in Exodus. So Moses finished the work. Kevin, can you go to Genesis 2, verse 2? Genesis 2, verse 2 makes me think right away of, yes, going back to uh, the early days. By the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God completed his work. And here you have another picture of God finishing his work through Moses. Now, I'm just going to tell you that obviously I, I believe points to Moses finishing the work to ultimately Jesus is going to finish the work. So you think about this. In Genesis, God says, I finished the work. Moses says he finishes the work. And now watch, watch what Jesus does and how he finishes the work as well. Kevin, can you go to John 17, verse 4? I glorified you on the earth. This is Jesus. This is the, the priestly prayer, Jesus's prayer, by completing the work you gave me to do. Moses serves as a deliverer in the book of Exodus. And so does Jesus in the book of John. Moses says, I finished the work, and Jesus finishes the work as well. Kevin, can you go to John 19, verse 28? When Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, there you go, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty, verse 29. A jar full, full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed a sponge, he's up on the cross, full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. And then in verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, his hands are out, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know, I think about the book of Genesis and God finishing the work of creation and then Moses finishing the tabernacle so that people could begin to experience the presence of God because Moses was faithful, but now all of a sudden you see Jesus and he says, I have finished the work. Why? So you and I could experience his presence. The veil has been torn and it's done. It's a cool picture. It's a powerful picture. And all because Moses finished the work and Jesus finished the work. In verse 34 of Exodus 40, the cloud covered the tent of the meeting. Remember, the work was done. The cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the the tabernacle. In other words, uh, Nelson's the commentator says his presence was obvious. His uh, his significance was felt, and his awe-inspiring inspiring wonder you could just sense. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse thirty-five, Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it. I love that. His presence was so thick. Have you ever heard that phrase, that my presence is so thick? Moses couldn't even go in. He was terrified. He was petrified, like, oh my. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Uh, did you see this? It said it again. Go back to verse 35, 34, Kevin. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle in verse 35. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I'm pretty sure the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Everything had been anointed. Everything had been built. Everything was finished. And now you can say the glory of the Lord is in the tabernacle. All because of one man's faith and obedience to listen on a Mount of Sinai, to listen in a wilderness. And then all of a sudden, all of the people, they're beginning to see God's presence. They're sensing God's presence. But we've got to be careful. Our sins will drive away God's glory. In fact, can you go to... 1 Samuel 4, 21 and 22. Um, when the priests and the people began to sin against God, this is what happened. In 1 Samuel 4, 21, she, said, she named the boy Ichabod. So this name Ichabod means the glory has departed from Israel. Referring to, and we know the story, Kevin, you were talking about the story, the capture of the ark and to the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. Now watch in verse 22. 
the glory has departed from Israel. Ichabod, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured because they were not obedient to what God asked them to do. Kevin, would you agree? Correct. When we stray away from, the, in this context, okay, it's okay to say this, the rules and the regulations that God has set in place, if we're not following those in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the glory of the Lord departs. We do not want Ichabod. And so in verse 36, if you go back to Exodus 40, it's a powerful picture. The Israelites, they set out whenever the cloud was taken. I mean, they, they know about this cloud. This cloud has, 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 has led the way so many times. And the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. In other words, it's just beginning. The Israelites' journey is just beginning. And in fact, in Exodus 13 and Numbers 9, you see the cloud lifting and then the Israelites follow. And then when that happens, this whole thing, it moves. <laughs> if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. And in verse 38 of Exodus 40, for the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel. All the people, all the Israelites, they saw throughout all the stages of the journey, they saw the presence of the Lord. <laughs> There's multiple ways we can go here today, but this is the end of Exodus. And so here's how I want to wrap up Exodus. One simple thing I just want to remind you, okay, just simply, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I just want to let everybody know where the glory of the Lord is now. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. And in verse 20, it says this, for you are bought a price. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your body. When you walk, you are carrying the presence of God. You're carrying the glory of God wherever you go. And it's another incredible model that when the glory of the Lord goes, the people follow. And I want to encourage you in the book of Exodus <laughs> to believe that. You know, Philip Ryken, he, he says 10 things. I'm not going to ask you to write them down because of time, but I want to list 10 things about, and it's, a, it's going to be the quickest summary you've ever heard of Exodus in your life. Remember, watch this. Jesus is the Moses of our salvation. Remember, he's a mediator who goes before us. Jesus is the lamb of our Passover. He's a sacrifice of our sins. Jesus is our way out of Egypt, and he delivers who baptizes us in the sea of grace. Remember, Jesus is our, our, our bread in the wilderness, and he provides who gives us what we need daily. Jesus is also our voice, it says, from the mountain, declaring the law for our lives and just continuing the description of Jesus in the book of Exodus, Jesus is the altar, the altar of our burning when we offer praise up to him. Jesus is the light on our lampstand, and he's the source of our, of our life and our light. And Jesus is the basin of our cleansing, the sanctifier of our souls. I love the book of Exodus because there's so many images of who Christ is. And Riken says that Jesus is our great high priest who who prays for us at the altar of incense. And then I love this one. Jesus is the blood on the mercy seat. He's the atonement that reconciles us to God. And Kevin, if you would, can you go to Jude 1.5? Remember this, the great God of the Exodus has saved us. And his name is Jesus. Jude 1.5 says, now I want to remind you though, you know all these things. The Lord first saved a people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. Jesus is the one who saved the people from Egypt, and he's the one who saves us. Thanks, guys, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.